In space, supernova explosions, which are unfortunately extremely rare, occur in our galaxy about once every thousand years. Shown here are the dates of the supernova explosions that have been recorded in our galaxy. One of the most famous took place in 1054, and another, no less famous, was in the year 1604. By 1608, people had already invented the telescope. However, in those days, it was mainly the monks who wrote about this phenomenon, and they described it as absolutely mythical. Since the entire galaxy would glow at night, as in the daytime, due to the sheer amount of released energy, and it gradually fades away over a period of 60 days. The last one was a distant flash that took place in February in 1987. The distance was 10 to the power of 24 centimeters. From there it flew 2 times 10 to the power of 6 light years. The process is a result of the fact that when a particle flies, it begins to slow down and gradually its characteristic losses increase and it eventually comes to a stop. Here is a graph of the energy release for iron, xenon, lead and uranium. For a super heavy element, the curve would look like this. In principle, if the substance has a crystalline structure, then the latent track that is formed strictly to this relativistic particle, which comes to a stop, the track of which can be made visible if it is etched in alkali. If it is poorly etched, then it must be heated and etched in hot alkali. Then we can see that this track will begin to manifest itself depending on the threshold. Above a certain threshold, it will manifest, and below this threshold, it will not manifest in any way. Then we will see tracks of different lengths after such etching. Now, if the threshold is here, then we can see lead of this length, thorium and uranium will be of this length, and the superheavy element will be of this length. It turns out that by cutting off these loss curves, we will have those zones that can then be etched and you can see these tracks depending on the atomic number of the stopped nucleus. And now we will look at these tracks in length, choosing, for example, a meteorite in which you can see small grains of crystals. These are called olivines. An olivine is a rock-forming mineral, and women love to wear them. There are also natural olivines that are found in meteorites, that is, they are of cosmic origin. A property of olivines is that if a track has entered it, then you can clean it and etch it and see the tracks of different lengths in this etching. Let's draw the spectrum of fossil tracks in graph form. There will be thorium and uranium. Principally and atomically, there may be something after the uranium. If there is nothing, then there cannot be any super heavy elements. And if there is something, then they will appear in this place. To understand the situation, you can calibrate everything. You can take these olivines, put them in an accelerator, irradiate the olivines with relativistic uranium, thorium, lead and gold. In general, it is necessary to do a calibration. And this calibration will then create a spectrum which will serve as a benchmark. And you can see the difference between the calibrated uranium 
which was obtained at the accelerator, and the uranium which was found in the spectrum of this meteorite. If we take the individual tracks that were visible behind uranium and attribute them to the number of uranium tracks, of which about 2,000 were observed, then we can say that the flux of the superheavy group in relation to the thorium-uranium group is less than 0.003%. These are the results of searches for superheavy elements in space. And now we are searching for superheavy nuclei in cosmic rays. You see, the distribution of elements in cosmic rays is very close to each other, as in the solar system. Now, we are looking at this distribution outside the solar system, indicated by the blue dot. Like I said, this is the result. And again, if we put cosmic ray data on our calculated curve, we still fall short reaching only up to this point.